these are what we all often talk about as firmigerics, the ones that survive pasteurization, things like Corona bacteria, uh, some strips. Uh, but most of those are, are pretty readily killed if we go up to um, say 100 degrees. But when we come to our spore forming ones, it's a uh, very, very different animals. Um, so these are bacteria that produce spores. And just to refresh your memory of what a spore is, it's a, it's a dormant, so it's, an, it's a non-growing state of, the, of a bacterium. Um, and it, it for, the, the bacterium tends to form into these, this little um, dormant state when the growth conditions are unfavorable. So when things are not going their way, they decide that they, they better protect themselves and they form these really um, quite um, resistant spores. And I, I, I say resistant um, uh, deliberately there because that's the, the reason why we have to, to use much, um, much more uh, intense uh, conditions to, to kill them. Now the spores are, are multi-layer, they're, they're an incredible structure. So you can just see in that, uh, that little diagram there, you've got the, uh, the core with your DNA and so forth. Then you've got a cytoplasmic membrane, then you've got a spore wall, then you've got a cortex, and then you've got a keratin spore coat. So very, very um, complex, complex structure. Now the important thing about, about them is that they're very dry and it's you can't kill bacterium if you haven't got some water there so you've got to get water into them somehow to to um, uh, to make them uh, susceptible to to killing so they're very heat resistant um, none, none of the spores are affected by our normal pasteurization procedures so all of our pasteurized milk still contains some spores but i might say that the normal level of spores in milk is extremely low it's Sometimes it's less than 10 per mil, so it's so very, very few there. But unfortunately, they're the ones that can, can carry through uh, heat processes and other processes and can cause problems um, uh, later on during storage of the product. So these are our targets for, for sterilization. We've got to kill the spores. If we can't kill the spores, we can't make a sterile product. So when, when a spore germinates, it turns into what we call a vegetative form. It can grow, um, just think of a plant seed. It, um, it, 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 it's like a, a spore, if you like, and, and it'll, it'll grow once it gets some moisture and, and, um, and the conditions are right. Uh, but of course, the difference between a plant and a, a bacterial spore is that um, spores, bacteria can only multiply and can only grow by dividing and, and multiplying. So there's a, a major difference there. Uh, now, the vegetative form of spore forming bacteria, they're easy to kill. So they're just like a pseudomonas or, or, or something like that. They're, they're easy to kill. So one way of uh, destroying spore forming bacteria is to get the spore to turn into a vegetative form and then we can kill that. This is a little diagram I, I got off the, off the web. And I think it, it shows fairly clearly just what, what a spore is and how, how, how it forms. But, so if we start with our vegetative cell over here, uh, it then uh, goes through this pre-spore pre stage, uh, forms this, uh, uh, the, the spore inside the cell, which, uh, which it eventually um, uh, gets rid of and, and, and we get a free, uh, in, a free spore. Sometimes these are called endospores because they're within the the uh, bacterium itself. And of course, once we've got a vegetative cell here, we can get growth. So we get this division here and, and, um, and, and so it multiplies. If you looked at it under a microscope, this is the sort of thing you'd see. So you can see these little dobs, those, those little ones are, are the spores that are, have, uh, have come out of the cells. Then you've got other ones here where you've got the spore within the cells and you've got some vegetative cells as well. So, so you'll always have a combination of these depending on the, on the conditions and the growth conditions for the, uh, for the bug. Okay, so we wanna make um, sterile products and importantly what we, we talk about is commercially sterile products because theoretically you can't actually get um, a product which has got no bacterium at all. Um, 
you might get some that um, have very, very, very low amounts, like like one bug per per hundred liters or something like that. But um, it's still not completely um, devoid of any bacteria. So we talk about commercial sterility, and the definition of that is that if we've got a sterile product, the bacteria that we've got in there won't grow under our normal um, conditions of storage. Now, normal conditions of storage, of course, is is probably up to well, today here in Brisbane it's about 37, so it's, uh, it's, it's prob that's probably the normal conditions today. So we don't want anything that's going to grow in, under those conditions. Uh, it, it may contain bacteria still, of course, and, and these, um, but these shouldn't grow under the normal conditions of storage. So we can achieve commercial sterility um, when any of the spores are likely to germinate and grow during storage are destroyed. So we really want to kill those ones which are likely to grow at, um, at room temperature. Hence the aim of the sterilization, I, I, I repeat, is to get rid of spores. Uh, so the whole thing is, is to do with um, um, eliminating the spores. That might be um, killing them, it, it might be removing them in some way. Now I just put a note down the bottom here um, sterilization, of course, is a broad term, but what we're talking about here today are liquid products. We're not talking about the surfaces of uh, packaging material and so forth, which there are a lot of different ways that you can, you can sterilize those, those surfaces, and that's, that's another whole, uh, whole topic. So we won't be talking about that today, and you'll see I've put a few things down there, steam, hydrogen peroxide, with all that UV light, various gases, and cold plasma. They, they're all very good for sterilizing surfaces, but um, uh, some of those are not suitable for, uh, for sterilizing liquid products. Okay, let's have a look at what we've got already got, what sort of traditional sterilization processes are in, in place. I guess the two major ones are uh, the batch sterilization, sometimes we call it in container or retort um, sterilization, um, and, and UHT processing. UHT being the continuous process, uh, the in-container one being a, a batch process. Both of these cause the same amount of um, bacterial destruction as each other. So uh, both of them will pr produce commercially sterile products, but because they, they have different time temperature conditions, they, they have different effects on the, on the product. So if we just look at the in-container, the batch sterilization one first, so this uses a retort into which the packaged product is, is placed. So we, uh, we might put the, the product in cans or in bottles and, and put these into a, a retort. Um, heat, it, heat it up so that it goes up to 110, 120 for 10 to 20 minutes, and, and of course it's under pressure. Now those temperature and times, of course, apply to the colder spot in the, in the product. And, and because, of, um, because of that, there are retorts now which uh, heat up and, and, uh, a lot quicker and cool down a lot quicker. Uh, some of these are, are shaking ones and rolling ones and so forth. So this is this is so that the there's a, a, a mix of the product in the in the container, and we get a faster uh, uh, faster heat up and, and cool down. And I've just I put a, a um, time temperature uh, graph there, and you'll see it goes up to about. Um, or 3,500 seconds. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and the last point on there is that um, the in-container sterilization, the retort uh, process, causes the milk to go, go a bit brown and also has a very strong cooked flavor. And I guess that's why um, UHT processing was introduced in the first place to try and get uh, a better product. So if we look at UHT processing, as I said, this is a continuous flow process and hence um, much more popular than a, 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 a batch process. This is now the pretty much the standard method of, of sterilizing milk. And here we're heating the product to around about 140 for, for a few seconds. So that's quite different from, from what we had with the, the batch, uh, batch sterilizing. The heat up and the cool down very much faster. And I'll put these graphs in here. And, and remember the, the, uh, the previous one was, uh, had a, a time of about three and a half, three three thousand five hundred seconds. Whoops. 
these ones you'll see this one's under 300 seconds and, and if we go a direct process where we're putting the steam and the milk directly in, in contact uh, it's all over in um, in much less than 100 seconds so uh, so the big difference in the the times it, 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 um, it takes so the heating's by steam it can either directly as as we've got here or indirectly where you've got heat exchanges where you've got steam on one side and, and milk on the other side this causes a lot less change to the, to the product. Uh, the changes that we, we would normally notice would be colour and, and, and the cooked flavour. So much less of that in UHT processing. So they're the, they're the two major ones that, um, uh, that are around today. But I just want to now talk about some of the non-traditional ones and some of these you might have heard of and, and, and some of you, some you might not have. Um, I'll just talk about three different ones. Um, the first one is omic, um, and then I'll talk about electrically heated tube and microwave, and, and some of these, of course, will be familiar to you. Now, firstly, the omic heating, and this has been around for, for quite a long time, but and it's, it's used in for some products, but really hasn't taken off in the, in the dairy industry. Um, why that is, I'm, I'm not exactly certain. Uh, it's also called dual heating, because what we're doing is using the the product itself as a, a resistor and and as you know if you put um, a current through a resistor it gets hot and so that's exactly what happens here so the passage of electricity through the product um, heats it up so one of the advantages is that there's no heated tubes so you don't have any any burn on on, on tubes like you normally would have in a, uh, a traditional heating process it's pretty efficient in terms of the conversion of, of uh, electric, electrical energy to, to heat, close to 100%. And I'll talk about uh, another one which is a lot less than that soon. Pretty rapid heating to sterilization temperature. And this is one of its uh, big advantages. But of course, there's no rapid cooling process. So a lot of these um, non-traditional thermal processes would, would probably be much more attractive if if they had a corresponding uh, rapid cooling technology as well. But to date, that hasn't been invented. So all you inventors out there, uh, have, a, have a think about how you might do that. So it's suitable for all liquid products, uh, including ones that have got particles in them. So, uh, and that's been one of the, the advantages of, of omic heating, which you can, you can heat um, things with, uh, with, with bits and pieces in them. Now, the next one, and some of you may not have heard of this one, the electrically heated tube um, technology, um, sometimes called current passage tube technology, or probably the most common term is ActiDual. And that's, um, it's named after the company that introduced it, and that's Actini. Um, Actini is not the only one producing these, these um, <coughs> excuse me, sterilizers, but um, Actini is, is certainly a, uh, a major one. So in this one, the electricity heats up the stainless steel tubes by passage of the electricity through the tube. So in other words, we're using the resistance of the, the stainless steel itself. Excuse me, we'll have a little drink. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, now it can heat up pretty quickly and it can heat up to 400 degrees. It's probably higher than what um, we need for most um, um, milk processing. I guess its big advantage is that there's no no steam required, so you don't you don't need um, boilers, you you don't need people trained as boiler operators, etc. Uh, the rate of heating can, can be controlled a bit like um, you you control the rate of heating on on your stove, for example. So it's a matter of just um, changing the, the the amount of um, electricity going in. Uh, and so you can you can tailor that for your product, a slower heating for viscous products or a more rapid heating for, uh, for, <clears throat> for less bit, uh, viscous products. And again, you can heat, heat very rapidly to the sterilization temperature, but there's no rapid cooling. Um, this has been used for UHT milk and desserts and some other more viscous products in France um, since, since the 1990s. Um, I visited one of these um, 
several years ago and uh, they, they had quite a few of these units in the in the factory I went to and they've been operating very nicely for, for some time and, and they were very happy with them. Now I put down there the electricity cost is an important factor and the reason why I put that is because I think um, and particularly now electricity cost is, is very high and so that, <clears throat> that, um, that is an important factor. Of course in France the the electricity is produced by nuclear power and, and it's relatively cheap compared with here. <coughs> me. me. Okay, now microwave heating, and we're all familiar with my microwave heating. Um, <coughs> it's called dielectric heating, so it, it, it heats by virtue of the fact that it, um, it stimulates um, molecular dipoles, these things like water that have a positive and negative uh, part to them and it vibrates them and the vibration causes heat and I think that's fairly commonly known. <coughs> so it uses frequencies of, uh, there's only two frequencies that are allowed, all the other frequencies are reserved for communications. So 915 and that's the one in, in our home, home ovens and 2450, which is used um, in industrially. This is called a volumetric heating process, and I suppose uh, not unlike ohmic in that, in that regard, um, but it's not uniform and you get hot, hot and cold spots. And that's been one of the things that's um, held microwave heating back, I guess, is uh, the fact that you, you can get some, some cold spots and that's the last thing you want if you're trying to sterilize a product. Uh, so it's not quite as efficient as ohmic heating, only about 65% compared to 100%, close to 100% for, for ohmic. Uh, again, you can get rapid heating to, to sterilization temperature, but not rapid cooling. So a bit of a crack record there, but that's the, that's the, the thing about these, uh, these alternative heating technologies, that there's no new alternative cooling technology. Now, microwave heating um, industrial is, uh, it's a bit like um, steam heating for UHT and, and in container sterilization, we've got batch and continuous. So the batch sterilization, uh, I guess, is, is pretty much like um, uh, in container sterilization using steam. Um, it's a patented process and it goes by the, by the name of, of MATS, Microwave Assisted Thermal Sterilization. It operates at 915 uh, megahertz and um, it's actually commercialized in the states by a company called 915 labs and I guess the reason why it was called that is because it operates at 915. So it treats packaged food in pouches in pressurized hot water I guess not unlike um, our, our normal batch um, uh, steam, steam heating. This process has been approved in the US for production of shelf stable food, sterile food in other words um, since since 2010 and I know there's interest in it for military foods but but not only and I think that the manufacturers go to pains to point out that it's not just for military foods so I think it's a case of watch this space if um, if we're looking at um, batch heating. Now the continuous sterilization and I guess this is a fairly recent innovation in, in microwave heating although there have been pilot plants around um, UHT pilot plants, which uh, are based on microwave heating for some time. Microthermics, for example, have a microwave um, um, option. Um, the, in in the, the continuous uh, microwave heating, it uses a cylindrical microwave applicator. So I guess it's, uh, it's like a tube that you pass your product through, operating at 915 hertz, megahertz. Uh, so in comparison to milk processed in traditional UHT plant with the same heating rate. In other words, it's got the same and, and, it, ha, and it has the same F0, so it kills the bacteria to the same extent. Microwave treated milk has been shown to have a better flavour than uh, traditionally um, heated UHT milk. Um, and I guess that's mainly due to the fact that we get a very, very sharp um, rise in temperature, a very, uh, very, very quick heat up to the um, to the sterilization temperature. However, it doesn't seem to be a, have been adopted commercially, although 
Uh, some, some, some of you may know more than I do about that, but um, I can't see that it has been adopted, but there's certainly, theoretically, there's no reason why it, um, it shouldn't be. Okay, so that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's the only um, non-traditional thermal processes that are sort of on the, on the horizon at the moment. And so what about non-thermal ones? And I guess that's probably what you expected me to spend most of the, this webinar on. And um, I've had to think about it in, in terms of what, uh, what are possible and, and um, some that are probably pretty impossible. There are a lot of these non-thermal technologies around um, and, and they have been around for quite a while and I think <clears throat> a lot of you would have heard of things like ultrasound and pulse electric field and, uh, and, and so forth for, for some time. But um, the, the thing that most of them have in common is that um, they're capable of, filling, of killing vegetative bacteria, that's the non-spore forming ones, but hardly any of them can kill spores. And if they can't kill spores, they're really of no use to us for, for sterilization purposes. However, most of them can kill spores, or a lot of them can kill spores, if you combine it with some, some heat process. So, so what I'm saying is if you, if you do, if you use these technologies at room, te room temperature, in most cases, you won't get um, a kill of, um, of spores. If you raise the temperature, in some of them, you do get a kill of spores. And that's what I really want to talk about. So currently, I think there's only two, two that have a potential use for sterilizing milk. One's called high pressure processing, and um, we'll talk about these soon. And the other one is a similar but different one, high pressure homogenization. So it's, it's a homogenizer like we know it in the, in the, in the dairy industry, but operating it at very high pressure. Again, both of these need to operate at elevated temperature to kill spores. They, they both have an effect on vegetative bacteria at room temperature. So if we want to kill spores, we have to raise the temperature as well. The, the other um, alternative technologies around, things like ultrasound and so forth, uh, they, they have a role in that they can weaken the spores and enable them to be killed at a lower temperature than what we'd normally use in a UHT process. So, that um, could be taken advantage of um, in, in the future. But again, up until now, um, we haven't um, seen that used commercially. But I'll, I'll just demonstrate that to you at the end of the, the webinar. Okay, high pressure processing. And um, some of you may have heard a presentation I gave on this um, 2016. And um, I, I gave that webinar soon after the first uh, pasteurized milk, um, high pressure processed pasteurized milk was released in, in Australia. Um, so that's been on the market for a while. Um, but now I want to talk about can we go the step further and use high pressure processing to actually sterilize milk and have something equivalent to UHT milk. So just a little bit of recap on what high pressure processing is all about. It uses really high pressures, 100, 100 to 800 megapascals. Now that's, um, that's pretty high. Um, usually uh, to, to pasteurize a product, we use something like five, 500 megapascals at 40 to 60 degrees for, for as little as two minutes, but it could, it could go up to 30 minutes. It's almost all done in, in batch processing. And the cylinder, the biggest cylinders that I can find at the moment are 525 litres. When I gave this talk in 2016, the, the biggest one was 400 litres. So maybe if I give this talk in a couple of years time, it'll be up to 1,000 litres, who, who knows? But um, you can imagine the, the stresses and strains put on a, a cylinder operating at, um, at 500 megapascals. So uh, the bigger the cylinder, the more difficult it is to, to uh, retain that sort of pressure. So I'll put a little diagram in there just to, to show you the sort of things that happen. You have a piston um, that um, increases the pressure and you've got a sample inside uh, that um, gets that's sealed uh, but um, gets affected by the pressure. Why, why are people interested in high pressure and what are its benefits? I guess the thing is that um, particularly if you, if you don't go to too high a temperature, 
you have very little effect on the flavor, the color, or the nutrients. So compared with heat processing to get a similar effect, you have a much fresher tasting and, and looking um, uh, product. So that's the advantage of it. Uh, the other, another advantage is that it doesn't inactivate some of the bioactive compound, com components we've got in milk, things like immunoglobulins. Um, even pasteurization uh, destroys a lot of the immunoglobulins in, in milk. And it's, it's, it's certainly impossible to, to UHT milk and, and retain things like immunoglobulins in their active form. The other big thing about uh, high pressure processing is that the pressurization occurs uniformly. And some of you might remember Pascal's principle from, from your school days. Pascal's principle just says that the, the uh, pressure is exerted equally in all directions. And you can see that by the arrows in that little diagram there. Uh, now that, that's a pretty important point because you think of heat processing, particularly if you're heating a tube or a, a container where the, the, the heat has to be conducted from the, the walls of that container into the product, um, the, it's impossible to get very uniform uh, heating. Uh, whereas with pressurization, immediately you, you apply the pressure, the pressure is exerted equally in all directions. And so you can get that happening in, uh, almost instantaneously. So what products are around at the moment? Well, it's been used commercially for a range of things, yogurt, sauces, fruit juices, meats, seafood, prepared meals is a, is a big one. Guacamole is probably the, the biggest one, uh, particularly in Mexico, uh, hundreds of tons of, uh, of guacamole, that's the, the avocado paste, is produced um, annually. Uh, mainly because uh, uh, if you try and heat avocado, it goes brown. If you high pressure process it, it doesn't. And, uh, and milk, of course, and I've put the New South Wales one here, the one that was released in 2016. Cold pressed raw milk, they call it. I'm calling it, it uh, pasteurized because it's equivalent to, to pasteurized milk in terms of um, uh, its safety. Uh, but I've just found that there was a, a product um, released in Mexico in 2013, 2014, um, which was uh, produced by, uh, by high pressure as well. So all the products produced today have been pasteurized and I put that in inverted commas because pasteurized, pasteurization normally signifies some sort of heat process. These are not heat process, but they're not sterilized. So in other words, the spores are not killed. So I guess the, the question is, can we use it for sterilization? And I guess the answer is yes, we can um, heat it, but it has to be at pretty high pressures and pretty high temperatures. So we've, we're putting a huge strain on our equipment to do that. So up to 800 megapascals, 60 to 90 degrees C for about 15 minutes. So you're really hitting it to, to do that. And of course, now we're starting to get up into a region where we might get some, some heat induced changes as well. So we can't have everything. Uh, now the process is called process assisted thermal sterilization. You remember we had microwave assisted thermal sterilization on mats. Now we've got PATS. Um, or it's even been called high pressure, high temperature, which is, I guess, similar to um, HTST or even UHT. So this enables the, the products to be sterilized, but um, because we're using high pressures, we can do that at a lower temperature than what we'd, we'd normally use for UHT. So, so we might, um, uh, if we, okay, if we, okay, if we use 60 to 90 degrees, uh, we'll get some, some heat generated during pressurization, and that's one of the things we can take account of. Um, three to five degrees per 100 uh, megapascals. So if we, if we treat something at, at 600 megapascals, we could get up to maybe 20 degrees increase in temperature uh, during the pressurization. As soon as we release that pressure, that temperature comes right back down to where it was to start with. So it's a, it's a nice way of getting a, an increase in temperature, hold it for a certain time, and then release it as soon as we release the pressure. It's called adiabatic heating or compression heating, some people call it. So if we start with, say, 60 to 90 degrees, we, we could reach 90 to 130 degrees using 
pressure assisted thermal sterilization. That's using 60 or 600 or 800 megapascals. The, like a lot of these, uh, these technologies, the, the effect of um, high pressure on spores depends a lot on the, on the species and on the strain even of spores. So, so I've seen um, papers where they've looked at you know, one of the bacillus species and, and some of the bacillus species are reasonably easily destroyed. Others are much more um, tolerant to, to the pressure. So it really depends on the, on the species and, and the strain. So what's our advantage and disadvantage of using something like PATS? I guess it's advantage that we get a, a product which has a better quality than the thermally sterilized product. In other words, we don't, we don't have to heat it as hot um, to get the same, same effect. And it's the heat that really that causes most of the changes in our, in our, heat, our uh, uh, processed products. Uniformity of treatment, as I said, Pascal's principle applies. And so it's suitable for shelf stable, small volume, high, high value products. So I see there's one on the market and that's um, uh, based on colostrum. I think it's called Cold Plus. And that has a shelf life at, um, at room temperature of about six months. So it's a, it is a sterile product. Uh, so there's, there are products around. Infant formula is another one. Uh, as you know, infant formula uh, is a fairly, um, I'm going to say a difficult product, not a difficult product, but you have to be very, very careful with it that you don't um, introduce any, any bugs which are, are not wanted there. So, a lot of products are, are sterilized, a lot of infant formula products are sterilized, and this, this offers an advantage um, over uh, straight you know, thermal processing. What's its disadvantage? Well, the high pressures and the high temperatures really put a huge demand on equipment. Even at um, lower pressures and lower temperatures, all, all high pressure gear has to be serviced on a regular basis, and um, you know, it's only allowed to do so many runs. Well, if you're increasing the pressure by um, a couple of hundred megapascals and you're increasing the temperature up to maybe starting at 90 degrees, that's putting a huge strain on the, on the process. And of course it's mostly batch processing and hence only small volumes in total can, can be treated. So that's, that's why we, we say it's most suitable for small volume uh, high value products. Now I just want to talk about high pressure homogenization and this is one that's sort of coming to its own in recent times. Um, to my knowledge it's not used yet in the dairy industry but I think it's a case of watch this space because it, it certainly could provided uh, the equipment can be uh, developed uh, to, to handle large volumes of, um, of a product like milk. <clears throat> so we're talking about homogenizing at 100 to, to 400 megapascals. Uh, now, at um, greater than about 300 megapascals, some people call it ultra high pressure, ultra high pressure homogenization. So I, I guess sort of equivalent to um, <clears throat> ultra high temperature uh, UHT. So milk is normally homogenized at 10 to 30 megapascals, and a lot of you will uh, be very familiar with normal homogenization processes in the industry today. So, so we're looking at something like 10 times the, the pressure um, that um, milk is normally homo homogenized at. We shouldn't confuse it with high pressure processing. A lot of people do. I've, I've seen articles talking about high pressure and they slip in articles from high pressure, process, high pressure uh, homogenization. The two are completely different and they, so they shouldn't be confused. <clears throat> uh, one thing about high pressure homogenization, which makes me think that it, it could be a possibility in the future. Is it's been used commercially in the pharmaceutical and chemical industries for some time. And again, these are, are probably using uh, smaller volumes than, than what um, we'd like to in the, in the dairy industry. But the fact is it's, it's an established technology in, in those industries. So the pressure is applied only during homogenization. And this, this happens only for much less than a second. So, so much, much different from high pressure processing where we might uh, pressurize at uh, 500 megapascals for, for 15 minutes. So this is a fraction of a second. So that's a major difference between the two. Uh, 
A second difference between this and high pressure processing is that when we homogenize, uh, we get a big increase in temperature. Uh, remember with high pressure, I mentioned the adiabatic heating about three to five degrees per 100 megapascals. Now we're looking at something like 20 degrees per 100 megapascals. So if we treat at 300 megapascals, which is sort of the, the upper limit at the moment that people go to, um, you get about a 60, 60 degree rise in temperature. So if we want to heat something um, at say, say 130 degrees for, uh, for a short time, we could start with, uh, with say 70 degrees and, and then allow the increase in, in temperature to take it up the rest of the time during the process. That, that increase in temperature, as you can imagine, is due to all those sort of forces that act in homogenization, things like the turbulence, cavitation, where you form these little bubbles which, you, which implode, shear stress, and of course impact speed, where, where the, the product is impacting on the, the impact ring. Um, the product remains at the highest temperature until you apply a cooling. And, and originally when this, was, this process was um, used, there was no sort of holding tube on it. But I see now that people are putting a holding tube on in much the same way as say um, the UHT process. So it, it, um, you might only have the pressure applied for um, a short while, but you'll, you'll, um, you'll have the, the, the temperature, the heat applied for uh, as long as you like. So, oops, sorry. Yeah, okay, <clears throat> uh, so we can sterilize milk if, if we start at say 300 megapascals and initial temperature of 75 to 80 degrees and, and this has been done and shown to, to give you a, a, a sterile product. So the final temperatures in that case were 133 to 139 degrees and in, in that case they just used a resonance time of around, around um, half a second but of course they could inc increase that if they wanted to uh, to put a holding tube in it. Okay, so what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of this process? Well, the big advantage is, is it's a continuous process. The, the thing that's held high pressure processing back, to my knowledge, is, um, is the fact that it's a batch process. And the very biggest batch you can do is, is 500, 500 litres. Uh, if you look at the, the sort of volumes that um, a lot of you people are interested or, and know about in, in your factories, uh, 500, 500 litres uh, wouldn't go very far. So it's a continuous process. It's, it's now used in some of the non-dairy industries. You can sterilise at the lower temperature for a shorter holding time than in, in say, UHT processing. And because of that, uh, you you'll should get a better, better tasting product. And of course, it's a homogeniser, so you're getting, um, getting two for the price of one. You're getting very good homogenization as well as the as the uh, the heat and and uh, moisturisation uh, uh, effects. Disadvantages, well, the big disadvantage, I suppose, is equipment limitations. We um, we we don't have uh, a high pressure moisturiser that's going to do several thousand litres an hour, um, which is what we'd need if we were going to use it for, say, say milk. <clears throat> um, there are limitations on the uh, because of the high pressures generated, uh, <clears throat> we had a little, we had a, a high pressure moisturiser at, um, <clears throat> at the University of Queensland and it was rated to go up to 400 uh, megapascals, but um, we were told that if you're going to use it at 400 megapascals, only run it for a very short time um, because it's not, it's not designed to take those sorts of pressures. So, so there are limitations in terms of pressures generated. So. That's why most, um, most of the research has been done up to about 300 megapascals and the capacity of high pressure homogenizers, that's, um, that's what I think is probably holding it back. Any other alternatives? Um, well, there's a few around, but um, really um, they, uh, <clears throat> they're not really capable of uh, uh, causing sterilization. They can pasteurize because um, they can kill bacteria. Uh, and as I said earlier, some will weaken the spores and enable them to be killed at a lower temperature than when using heat alone. So that's, um, that's one of the, the possibilities. 
post-electric field technology. Now that's already being used for, for pasteurization and um, in, in Australia, uh, but it hasn't been used for, uh, for sterilization. So what we're doing with pulse electric field technology is uh, we're passing a, a current through, uh, through through the product at around about 30 kilo, kilovolts um, per centimeter at about 50 degrees, 10 to 20 pulses. And these pulses are very short duration. So the to total time is about, is about one second. So you get an equivalent to pasteurization from that. You get about, you can get up to 10 to the five log uh, or 10 to the 5 reduction in, in bacteria, which is what pasteurization requires. If we combine that with HTST pasteurization, that's normal 72 degrees, 15 seconds, we can produce ESL milk. In other words, we can, we can have it keeping for several weeks rather than a couple of weeks. And if we combine it with heating at say 112 degrees for 30 seconds, we can actually produce sterile milk. And that's been done. Uh, so we know it's theoretically possible, but to my knowledge, it hasn't actually been been used in, in practice. So this, this is a little diagram here, which uh, uh, give you a bit of an idea of what it looks like. This thing here is a, what I call the, the electric chair, if you like. It's the treatment cell, uh, which you pass the, the pulse electricity through. And this is this here is a, uh, the, the wherewithal for making the, the pulses. And this is where the product is flowing through here. Through, through the cell. Ultrasound, I've mentioned ultrasound a couple of times. What we're talking about is uh, at a frequency of about 20 kilohertz to up to 2.5 megahertz. Most of it's done around about 20 kilohertz. This is beyond the, the, the range of the human ear, which goes up to around about 16 kilohertz. Um, it kills vegeta vegetative bacteria by cavitation, a bit like the cavitation you get in homogenization. So you get a formation and collapse of these, these little bubbles and that, that puts a lot of stress on, on bacterial cells and, and, um, and splits them. Um, again, it's um, more effective in combination with heat and a slight pressure. If you just um, put, a, put a, a couple of um, a bar pressure on it, you can, you can increase the, the efficiency of homogenization a lot. Uh, and if you do it at a high temperature, it, it will also um, uh, kill more bugs. It's been shown to, if you, if we, this is some work that we did, we, we took the Psilocyphus which is the most common bacteria spore that you, you like you to encounter in, in UHT processing. Um, but we got a one, one log reduction in 120 minutes. Now that's, um, that's not very much. In other words, we're, we're just giving it a bit of a tickle and that's all. But no one's going to to use 120 minutes for uh, for for a process. What we did find though that it made it more susceptible to inactivation to heat, uh, but of course those long times preclude its use. Um, I just put this little diagram in here. This is this is one one of my students generated. This is um, heating spores um, at 116 degrees. These ones here hadn't been sonicated. These ones here had been sonicated. So you see the sonicated ones had all been destroyed by two minutes. The ones um, that hadn't, hadn't been sonicated um, took six minutes to destroy those. So I, I just put that in as an example of, of, of um, the effect of these things on, on their heat stability. And that's, um, that's something that these, uh, these other technologies might be able to be used for. What about radiation? And that, I suppose that's always going to be a, a question. We're talking about ionizing radiation, which is gamma radiation, uh, up to 10 kilogray. We get pasteurization at one to two kilograys, and we, get, we can get sterilization at greater than 10 kilograys. Now that's, a, that's pretty hefty. Um, unfortunately, we get a lot of off, off flavors being produced in milk uh, from the breakdown of fats and proteins. That's noticeable at less than, at less than one kilogray. And um, so that, that really makes it very difficult to be used for, uh, for even pasteurization. Some people say that you can get away with it up to about one kilogray. Uh, but of course, we do get a lot of loss of vitamins. Uh, we get bleaching of the milk fat. And I guess the big thing is that there's still consumer opposition to, 
to irradiation of, of foods. So people are frightened it's going to glow in the dark and all that sort of thing. So I don't think it's likely to be used um, in, um, in, in my lifetime anyhow. The other irradiation, of course, is UV irradiation. And I'll put this one in because only a um, couple of years ago, it was um, approved for commercial pasteurization of milk uh, in Europe by the European Food Safety Association. So, so it, it's, it's out there on the horizon. And if it, if it can be used for pasteurization, I guess the question is, can we take it a step further and use it for sterilization? Well, um, probably not. One, one of the problems with, with UV radiation is that um, it doesn't penetrate milk very well. It, it, it likes um, clear solutions. Uh, so you have to have a very thin film to, to do it. Uh, you do get some uh, changes in, in flavour. Uh, you get an unclean off flavour. Uh, at, at levels of radiation less than what you even need for the pasteurisation. So interesting, but I don't think we're going to be seeing it used for, for sterilisation. So that's, that's the only ones that I can see that are sort of possibilities. Um, and, 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 and probables. Uh, so just summing up, there's some non-traditional thermal processes uh, that could be used, omic, microwave and electric heated tube, and all these are, are really ready to go uh, at the moment. Uh, no non-thermal technologies that can be used alone, that's, it, that's without heat, to sterilise milk. With heat, then high pressure, high pressure homogenisation and possibly uh, high voltage pulse electric field technology um, are possibilities. I've given you a few references there and you'll see a lot of those are fairly recent so there's a lot of things happening in, in this, uh, this space at the moment. So thank you very much for your attention and um, uh, I'll be happy to, to answer any questions. Yeah, hi Hilton, why does chocolate milk containing cocoa need additional treatment compared to normal plain UHT milk to, to achieve sterility? Um, the main problem there is that um, that cocoa particles um, are very very good at um, at hiding spores. So cocoa, as it's uh, as it's produced, uh, has has a fair complement of spores, a whole range of different spores, and so we we need to try and kill those spores um, to to get a sterile product. And one of the the main ways that that's done is to is to get the spore to germinate. In other words, you you get, give it conditions that are going to make it um, germinate and become a, a vegetative form, which can be killed a lot easier. And so that's what a lot of people use a, a preheat um, preheat process to to get the spore to germinate and, and to um, become a vegetative cell. I think I think one of the reasons why cocoa particles are so difficult to um, to handle is that they they're very hard and um, they're a bit like a spore. They're um, uh, they're very difficult to get water into, and if you can't get water into them, then, then it's very difficult to kill the spore that's um, that's hiding in there. Okay, there's another one. Um, do you know if there is any publicly available work done on the relative per litre cost of using some of these novel sterilisation technologies? Uh, yeah, there are. Um, there's um, no, I haven't uh, referenced one there, but um, yes, yes, there are some. We can uh, follow up on that anyway, Hilton. Yeah, yeah. Yes. If um, if you, if you want a reference there, I, I haven't got reference for every every one of them, but um, I, I do know of a couple of uh, decent ones there.